This is just a follow-up to my video on the first episode of Graham Hancock's Netflix series. I'm going to look at some of the responses I received. And in answer to some of those posts, I'll take a look in this video at Hancock's claims about Gobekli Tepe, which is one of the world's oldest construction sites now in Turkey. We'll see how this guy can move huge 20-ton stone blocks all on his own, and we'll see why an innocent belief in lost civilizations can have real-world consequences. In my last video, I found lots of fabrications just in that first episode. Unfortunately, fans of Graham Hancock didn't want to talk about episode 1. Quite understandably, they asked, what about episode 7, or episode 3, or 5? What about all the things he didn't cover, like Gobekli Tepe, or Bimini Road, or water erosion around the Sphinx, or LIDAR findings in the Amazon, or Gobekli Tepe, or the Sphinx, or Clovis First, or Gobekli Tepe, or LIDAR and stuff, or the Sphinx, or Gobekli Tepe, or nothing before Clovis, or Ten Ton Blocks, or the Malta episode, or Bimini Road, or Gobekli Tepe. Why didn't I start with episode 5? Because when faced with a Netflix series, I usually tend to start at episode one. But hey, that's just me. I don't live by the conventional rules of society. I'm a rebel. The way I deal with predictable what about responses is to say I'll deal with just one what about. So give it your best shot. In this case, there were so many what abouts that the fairest thing to do was address the most popular of them, which is. What about Gobekli Tepe in episode 5? For time and copyright reasons, I'm not going to show the clips. I'll use the transcript instead. It's interesting that without the dramatic music and the triggering images, the lost civilization narrative looks even less convincing. And please note that, just like last time, I have zero interest in Hancock's personality, because this is not about his personality, or my personality, thanks for your interest. It's about the facts. We'll start with a claim I've already debunked. Referring to the Younger Dryas period around 12,000 years ago, Graham says... The world suffered through some kind of tremendous geological upheaval, including immense floods. But Hancock fans who watched my previous video already know that those immense floods never happened. The Younger Dryas sea level rise that Graham referred to was only around half an inch a year, and not very different to the rise in sea levels that had been going on for thousands of years before, and continued for thousands of years after the Younger Dryas and none of his fans disagreed. In episode 5, the one on Gobekli Tepe, Hancock continues, And around 11,600 years ago, the freeze ended with another final immense flood that raised sea levels around the world. No, there was no immense flood 11,600 years ago either. If there had been, and Hancock's talking about a global flood, it would show up in the stratigraphy. All floods leave a record. Every large tsunami leaves a record. If you've ever had a house flooded, you'll be familiar with the film of scum and mud and general debris it leaves behind. Flood deposits are easily recognisable in core samples taken from lakes and swamps. So episode 5 is no different to episode 1 in fabricating, that means making up, a series of immense and imaginary deluges, and even adding another one with a specific date. The other thing I quickly discovered is that episode 5 is no different to episode 1 in its derogatory depiction of archaeologists and the misrepresentation of their conclusions. In southeastern Turkey, near modern-day Sanlurfa, something remarkable happened around the end of the last ice age, Hancock says, our Stone Age hunter-gatherer ancestors suddenly discovered farming and began creating settlements. This, of course, is nonsense, according to archaeological evidence gathered over the last 30 years, as we'll see. But if you look down, it seems clear Hancock isn't trying to give us his belief. He thinks he's giving us the view of archaeologists. Now, I'm sure this is what Graham Hancock learned in elementary school back in the 60s, because I learned the same thing. That's why it's about 60 years out of date. No serious archaeologist these days thinks hunter-gatherers suddenly discovered farming and began creating settlements. 
But that view of history now cries out to be rewritten, Hankel says. Actually, it was rewritten over three decades ago. There have been hundreds of discoveries since the 1960s showing that hunter-gatherer societies were not what Graham calls simple and unsophisticated people. As I said in my last video, they had societies, culture, trade, language, art, and yes, even construction. They didn't suddenly discover farming. It was a transition that took thousands of years. As for Gobekli Tepe itself, based on everything we've been taught about prehistory, Graham says, it shouldn't exist. That would only be true if science was the same as religion, where the conclusion is an immutable belief that can't be overturned. In religion, or any kind of dogma, evidence is changed to be consistent with the dogmatic conclusion. We saw that in episode one. According to the lost civilization belief, coral pillars at Nan Madol shouldn't exist, so they were changed to man-made pillars. In science, it's the other way round. The conclusion has to be changed to be consistent with the evidence. There's a wonderful clip of creationist Ian Juby getting frustrated at how scientists change their conclusions about evolution every time they find new evidence. Evolution will simply make it fit, answers or not, because evolution conforms to whatever evidence it is presented with because it is not science. But that's precisely science. That's why archaeologists never deal with new evidence by saying it shouldn't exist. They simply change their understanding of the past, their conclusions in light of it. That's why the conclusion that there was nothing older than Clovis in North America was changed when archaeologists discovered pre-Clovis artifacts. The understanding that there were no settlements in the Amazon was overturned when LIDAR discovered settlements in the Amazon. And the understanding that Mesolithic hunter-gatherers didn't build large structures was overturned when archaeologists discovered Gobekli Tepe. None of these discoveries contradict our understanding of history. They only contradict our previous understanding of history. As Ian Tuby noted, conclusions in archaeology, like all sciences, change to be consistent with the latest evidence. If archaeologists were stuck in dogma and never changed, as Hancock claims, we'd still be stuck with the archaeology that he and I learned in the 1960s. Now, in anticipation of the posts that some of you are already writing, of course, there are a lot of fusty old archaeology professors with fixed ideas, just like in all sciences. Anyone who thinks otherwise hasn't watched my channel, where I'm constantly correcting old professors and PhDs who cling to dogmatic beliefs. But even the most dogmatic and determined professor, who told his students that nothing would be found below the Clovis layer in North America, had to eat his words when archaeologists did find artefacts below the Clovis layer. And please note, before you rewrite that furious post, this doesn't mean that the lost civilization belief must be true on the basis that our understanding of history always changes. Because our understanding changes based on evidence, not a belief dreamed up in an armchair and then made into a popular TV program. Sorry, but fake and fabricated evidence doesn't count. It may convince a Netflix audience, but it doesn't impress scientific journals. The next attempt to undermine archaeology is this. Archaeologists accept that it dates back to around 11,600 years ago. No, archaeologists don't accept the fact that it dates back to around 11,600 years ago. Archaeologists are telling us that it dates back to around that time. They were the ones who did the painstaking study dating it all. It's their conclusion. So why the rather odd wording? As I said in my last video, it's all about impressions and images. Graham could have simply said, archaeologists dated the site to around 11,600 years ago. Perfectly true. But that makes it look like archaeologists are making discoveries and not sticking rigidly to orthodoxy. So it doesn't fit the narrative of dogmatic, dumb archaeologists who have to be reluctantly dragged into accepting that something that lost civilization believers readily understand. Slipping the word accept makes it sound as though someone else did the dating and archaeologists grudgingly went along with it. The wording is no accident. 
In the media, words are carefully thought out to convey a particular standpoint. For example, look at the difference here, imagining a 17th century report about Galileo's discovery of the moons of Jupiter. The straightforward version would be, Galileo discovers that Jupiter has moons. Now, contrast that with, Galileo accepts that Jupiter has moons. See the difference? And journalists can make the insinuation even more damning by saying, Galileo admits that Jupiter has moons. It's just one manipulation of the audience, but little by little each line builds up this picture of Graham being out in front and archaeologists sticking to old ideas. The reality is that archaeologists not only dated this site, they hailed it as a breakthrough in our understanding of hunter-gatherer societies. Archaeology was rewritten. If they weren't advanced enough to design and build this megalithic wonder, he says, who did and why? But who says they weren't advanced enough? Certainly no one who's researched the site. This assumption that they weren't advanced enough is so dogmatic that it doesn't even look at the clear evidence against this. The program goes straight to the assumption that this must be the work of someone else. In the form of a question, of course, because, hey, just asking... I showed this technique of slipping an unsupported assumption into a question in my last video. Take a look if you haven't seen it, because it's a very popular advertising formula and we need to be on our guard against it. Notice also how Graham again uses trigger words, just as we saw in the last video, to build an image in his audience's heads. Built at a time when the earth was just emerging from the last ice age, when locals were still supposedly unsophisticated hunter-gatherers living in mud huts. But if they weren't advanced enough to design and build this megalithic wonder, who did and why? Since his aim is to downgrade Mesolithic hunter-gatherers and upgrade Gobekli Tepe, he uses words like simple, unsophisticated and mud huts to describe the former, and words like wonder and highly sophisticated and highly advanced to describe the latter. So let's lose all the trigger words and the emotional baggage and look at how difficult it might have been to build Gobekli Tepe. First, why would they have built the site in the first place? Archaeologists say the most likely answer is a spiritual or ceremonial meeting place. And this isn't unusual. Hunter-gatherer societies had widespread connections during the Mesolithic, and there's evidence they often came together in sacred places for feasting and trading, and no doubt for matchmaking and ceremonial worship. Australian Aborigines used to do it, Plains Indians used to do it, and clearly the people of Anatolia used to do it. And if you think it's far-fetched to suppose that people would put so much time and effort into a structure that was purely ceremonial and spiritual, just look at how much time and effort was put into building the beautiful, yet arguably pointless, cathedrals of Europe. The exact nature of their religion is hard to fathom, but evidence suggests that it may have started as a cemetery, a place on top of the hill where the dead were brought and their skulls defleshed and hung up. And the evidence shows that each stage of the building was deliberately buried and then restarted, but again, we don't know why. Next comes the planning. The first three enclosures of Gobekli Tepe are laid out on an equilateral triangle, which is fascinating from an archaeological point of view because prior to this discovery, the earliest dates when geometry was known to be part of the human thought process was 10,000 years ago. So now we know the earliest date is 11,500 years ago. But from the point of view of an ancient civilization... Hey, look, I drew this triangle freehand. It's a doodle. It's perfect! (laughs) So what? There's no reason why hunter-gatherers couldn't have made an equilateral triangle. All it takes is a long rope, which they had divided into three parts and pegged out. That's a nice triangle. Third, cutting the stones. What they made around 11,500 years ago was several enclosures ringed by pillars brought in from a nearby limestone quarry. This is one of the T-shaped pillars they were cutting out, around seven metres long, which for some reason they left in the ground. So we can see the quarrying process itself. How did they cut the stones? 
Surprisingly, he is using tools made of flint, which have been found all over the site. This kind of limestone is relatively soft, and flint is hard. So cutting it isn't a problem, and the limestone slabs are naturally faltered along vertical and horizontal lines, so as long as each side was cut away, the stone was free to move. I was curious to see how Graham explained these rather less-than-advanced flint tools, and the answer is, of course, he doesn't. As we saw in episode one, any evidence that doesn't fit the story of an advanced civilization is simply not mentioned. As for transporting the stones, that's not difficult either. There are many ways of moving large stones. A sled, wrapped in a roller, walked along, pulled on a rail. As I said in my last video, all it takes is rope, a few simple tools, lots of people and organisation. By the way, there's a great video showing how just one guy can move huge 20-ton stone blocks all on his own using simple cradles and pivot points. One small stone underneath a large block, and he can turn it single-handed. Two stones, and he can make it move. Wally Wallington here also shows how just one man can raise a huge block by rocking it back and forwards like a teeter-totter, and putting wooden blocks under the middle each time one side lifts up. And once it's raised up, it's a simple matter of leaning and pulling to slip it into a pit, and then to the vertical. So far, nothing suggests that these supposedly unsophisticated hunter-gatherers, living in mud huts, as Graham calls them, weren't advanced enough to cut stones with flint tools and move them. The only question is how these people sustained themselves. After all, farming societies can store grain and livestock and sustain a workforce on large projects. So if large numbers of hunter-gatherers stayed in one place during the construction of Gobekli Tepe, wouldn't they very quickly have exhausted everything they could hunt and gather in the area? Here again the evidence is changing our understanding of how hunter-gatherer societies lived, at least in that region at that time. According to a study by Dietrich et al. in 2019, handstones, pestles and mortars, grinding slabs and bowls were found at the site, all related to processing wild cereals that had been gathered. As for the hunting part, 60% of the butchered bones found at the site were gazelle. The other bones came from wild asses, no jokes please, vultures, cranes, ducks and geese. And everything suggests that the building was seasonal and the hunter-gatherers collected in that place at a time when gazelle were passing through in migratory herds and food was plentiful. The evidence clearly shows that Gobekli Tepe was built long before agriculture and animal domestication. The Netflix program doesn't even look at this evidence. It ignored it in favour of a familiar rhetorical technique. Give two people two choices, one of them your own belief and the other a far more absurd option, and ask them to choose which one makes more sense. Isn't it time to consider the possibility that the great megalithic enclosures weren't some miraculous overnight invention of hunter-gatherers, Graham asks, but were a legacy from a precociously advanced lost civilization of prehistory? This is a notion which mainstream archaeologists find almost offensive. They don't find the idea offensive, as far as I know. It's just that Hancock's ideas have been considered. There are numerous archaeologists who've looked at them, and they've been rejected for reasons I showed in the previous video, namely that a lot of the evidence for them has been fabricated, and there's no evidence that supports them, and a mountain of evidence that directly contradicts them. The idea that Gobekli Tepe suddenly miraculously sprung up overnight, to paraphrase Graham, has also been rejected because, again, the evidence shows that it didn't. But these are the only two options we're given. It's a common technique called a false dichotomy. I've shown this before when a Golden Crocoduck nominee, Brock Lee, used the same technique to divert attention from the idea that a hammer encased in sediment was the result of a well-known process called accretion. 
Just don't give the audience that option. Hypotheses one, the creation one. Maybe dinosaurs and man live together and these are just artifacts from before the flood. Possibility two, maybe aliens came here, dropped off these hammers, and then a Tyrannosaurus rex had to evolve human-like fingers to pick up all of these artifacts being left by the aliens. How many of you think the creation, the biblical view of humans and dinosaurs living together is more likely? And my kids used to do it when I refused to buy them candy in the supermarket. Do you want me to starve to death, they'd say? They assumed that when Dad was faced with the choice between candy and death, he'd very sensibly choose to buy the candy. What they didn't count on was Dad's cunning ability to spot a third option. Wait for dinner. Archaeologists find this simplistic choice between two unsupported ideas not offensive, that's too strong a word, but laughable, because it completely omits the third and most obvious option, that Gebekli Tepe was part of a learning curve, just like any other building. For example, if a future race of intelligent apes came across the remains of St Paul's Cathedral, and little else, they might well conclude that it came out of nowhere, overnight. They'd argue it's impossible for people at that time to suddenly acquire the skills and the knowledge to build something so incredible, so surely the only option is that wise men from a great civilization must have descended on London, built the cathedral, and then gone home again. But if you look at the wider context, you can see that St Paul's didn't spring up out of nowhere. Excavations further afield would reveal how buildings got larger and more complex over hundreds of years. You can clearly see a learning curve as builders copied old techniques and discovered new ones, sometimes learning from failures as often as successes. For example, flying buttresses at St Paul's were an innovation that developed after the failure of unsupported walls at the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul hundreds of years earlier. Dig below St Paul's and you'll find the remains of an older cathedral underneath, and further down still you'll see the remains of the old Roman settlement on Ludgate Hill. Future archaeologists can find the quarries and see how the stones were cut and transported. All of this context shows that St Paul's didn't just spring out of nowhere overnight, nor did it require an ancient civilization sailing in from somewhere else. Having presented his two options, Hancock then dismisses one of them as completely absurd. You can't just wake up one morning with no prior skills, no prior knowledge, no background in working with stone, and create something like Gobekli Tepe, he argues. And that only leaves us with, what luck, the option of his lost civilization. But hang on a minute. For once, archaeologists and Hancock are in agreement – this is a completely absurd option. So let's get rid of the false dichotomy and replace that nonsense option with the more realistic and sensible option proposed by archaeologists, that ancient Anatolians started on a smaller scale and worked their way up, and it took them around 1,500 years to build the entire site. There has to be a long history behind it, continues Hancock, and that history is completely missing, and to me it very strongly speaks of a lost civilization. Or it speaks very strongly of the fact that the long history is missing from the Netflix program. If you look at Gobekli Tepe in the wider context, as we did with St Paul's Cathedral, the evidence suggests that there was prior knowledge and there was a background of working with stone going back at least 2,000 years before Gobekli Tepe. It just didn't fit the idea of a lost civilization, so it wasn't mentioned. There are dozens of sites either being excavated or waiting to be excavated in the region, and Gobekli Tepe didn't remain the oldest site for long. Bonjuklutala, about 200 kilometres to the east of Gobekli Tepe, is estimated to have been built up to a thousand years earlier. Archaeologists have found that it was built in stages, starting with a small temple in the middle, in which four limestone blocks stand upright in the earth floor. And there are sites even older than that. Pinabasi Hoyuk dates back to around 16,000 years ago. It's a burial site and found so recently that I can't even find any scientific studies on it. But there was an announcement from the Turkish Ministry of Culture and Tourism last year, 
with photos that show small arrangements of stones 2,500 years older than Gobekli Tepe. The flint tools also have to be looked at in a wider context. There's no flint or obsidian in the Gobekli Tepe plateau, so it was brought in from further afield. Archaeologists have discovered a network of flint and obsidian trade from around that time, reaching as far away as Georgia in the Caucasus. The style of flint shaping, called napping, differs according to the different cultures from around the region who gathered at Gobekli Tepe. So by looking at Gobekli Tepe in context, there's more than enough evidence to support the conclusion that it was part of a learning curve, just like St Paul's Cathedral. Archaeologists are still literally just scratching the surface, but what little they've found so far is consistent with stone construction that began very crudely and simply and grew in size and complexity over thousands of years. So what evidence is there for what Hancock considers to be the only option? There's no evidence of any outside influence or advanced technology in the region at that time, Hancock says they transferred their technology and their skills. If so, what technology and which skills? Or, to put it another way... And what have they ever given us? That's a very good question. Did they teach them how to hunt gazelle? Or how to deflesh skulls? How to make flint axes? How to cut and move stones? Or how to pick wild grains and crush them? If so, it doesn't sound like these outsiders were any more advanced than the people they were supposed to be teaching. These are all things that ancient Anatolians were quite capable of doing themselves. It's kind of like a super-advanced race of aliens descending on my town and teaching us all how to make ravioli and mow the lawn. Gee, thanks, but I'm good. Hancock only comes up with one technology he thinks was transferred, for which he provides no evidence. There was no agriculture at Gobekli Tepe when it was built, he says, but strangely, at exactly the time that it was being created, 11,600 years ago, agriculture appears all around it. For me, what the evidence speaks to is pretty clear. It's a transfer of technology. Or it speaks to a claim directly contradicted by the evidence and even what Hancock is told in his own programme. Archaeologists have found no evidence of agriculture around Gobekli Tepe 11,600 years ago. Geneticists have carbon dated the earliest known cultivated strains of wheat in the area, in a village around 20 miles away, to 10,500 years ago, a thousand years after construction started. Hancock goes on to say, They that's the advanced lost civilization, already had knowledge of agriculture and they used that site to mobilize a local community, to organize them and to introduce them to agriculture. In that case, why were the people of Gobekli Tepe still eating what they could gather in the wild rather than the produce of these alleged farms gifted by an advanced civilization? And why were they hunting gazelle, vultures and other wild animals rather than domesticated sheep and goats. Hancock even repeats what an archaeologist confirms in the Netflix programme. They found no evidence of farming, Hancock says. The people who built this complex were definitely still hunter-gatherers. And he says it again, they are hunter-gatherers. So it's not much of a transfer of technology if people from this region completely ignored the technology and carried on doing what they had always been doing. If we look even further afield, there's no evidence that agriculture suddenly appeared elsewhere at this time. Cultivation was a long, slow and fitful process. The rest of the programme is speculation about star alignments and carved symbols, and people often complain that I post these transcripts with not enough time to read them, if only there was some kind of a pause button on your computer, like a space bar, that would stop the video for as long as you need to read them. Oh dear, too late. There are lots of coulds and maybes and what-ifs related to cherry-picks of the eclectic mix of carved wild animals, penises, pillars, all of different ages, and the various alignments that fit various theories. 
Could all those animal carvings actually be telling us something? But are they serpents, or could they represent something else? Could Gobekli Tepe be even more than that? What if its architects sought to leave behind a message of the greatest importance? What if this mysterious complex wasn't just a place of rituals? What if it's more than that? Is it possible they share a common inspiration? Is it possible that the great building projects in both places perhaps represented by those stone pillars? So we can take that perhaps to be Scorpius. Symbols on the stone might represent asterisms. But I'm not really interested in speculation. I'm only interested in what we can establish as fact. It would be great if believers in the lost civilization could come here and do something that Hancock didn't manage to do, provide just one piece of tangible evidence that links the builders of Gobekli Tepe to an advanced lost civilization. And what have they ever given us? It wasn't farming. It wasn't some kind of advanced tool making. It wasn't stone moving. So what was it? I made a similar appeal at the end of my last video after I showed how the only evidence Hancock produced in episode one had been fabricated. So I would love to hear from Hancock fans to see what you think. Please don't just write comments saying my video is bullshit or it's an ad hominem attack against Hancock. I'm not judging his eloquent speaking voice, his intelligence or his personality. What I'm concerned with are the fabrications and the omissions. So please address that. But all I got in response were tirades against archaeologists, lots of whatabouts, of course, and most bizarrely, lots of complaints that it was outrageous to even question and fact-check Hancock's claims. You knock Graham Hancock. You put him down. You should be ashamed of yourself for attacking, dismissing and smearing his work. Hancock haters piling on, trying to put Hancock down. A, A hit, hit piece. piece. The funny thing was that no one disagreed that Hancock had fabricated his evidence and they didn't even try to defend it. What they objected to was me showing these fabrications on a public forum, either because it undermined his work or because exposing fakery is somehow a personal attack. So I'm not optimistic that anyone will try to defend Hancock's fabrications and omissions in episode 5 either. But please do try. As always, I am more than willing to correct my video if I got something wrong. At the same time, I was very encouraged to see that a lot of people were prepared to look a bit more closely at Hancock's evidence and changed their minds once they realised that a lot of it was fabricated and that there's a lot of contradictory evidence that was missing from his programme. Now, you may well ask, but what harm do these innocent beliefs in a lost civilization do? Surely they're not hurting anyone, are they? Well, on a practical level, the problem is exemplified by what happened at Gunung Padang, where Hancock imagined there were secret rectangular chambers underneath a megalithic site which he claimed is a 20,000-year-old pyramid. I covered that in my last video. Other people believed this too, including the then president of Indonesia, Bambang Yuliono. Because if it was true, then Indonesia would be home to the oldest civilization in the world. So, of course, it became a source of immense national pride. So much so that the president assigned a large budget and encouraged digging underneath the site to reveal this supposed lost civilization. And this had two unfortunate effects. First, it diverted funds from real archaeological investigations, such as the nearby Pawan Cave site, which had been home to hunter-gatherers about 9,500 years ago. Excavations here tell us far more about the people who lived at that time than made-up TV stories about ancient pyramid builders. Secondly, with the president's backing, an army of around 500 untrained volunteers came to dig up the site and get to the lost civilization they believed was buried underneath, even though telemetry showed that this was just an extinct volcano with no evidence of any man-made structures. The project was called the Red and White Glory Operation, named after the colours of the Indonesian flag. To speed things along, President Yuliono even sent in soldiers to help and offered earth-moving equipment. Archaeologists, of course, were horrified. One of their complaints was that the soldiers and untrained amateurs were using hoes, no, this type of hoe, to hack at the ground, and were removing megalithic stones with no record of where they'd been laid. A World Heritage Site was in danger of being vandalised. <laughs> 
Fortunately, when a new president was elected, he stopped the uncontrolled dig and preserved the site for future generations. Now, I have no doubt that there'll be comments that this is censorship. Archaeologists are just jealous. They're trying to hush up evidence of a lost civilization, etc., etc. But imagine the outrage if a gullible Prime Minister of the UK... I'm not pointing fingers, this generic silhouette could be any dim-witted British Prime Minister, believed stories on TV about buried treasure under Stonehenge and recruited an army of shovel-wielding patriots to go and dig it up. I wonder what the reaction would be. But apart from all the practical effects of spreading these myths, surely there's a matter of principle involved. Do we really want to teach our children history based on fabrications and phony evidence? I mean, it's sometimes wonderful for instilling national pride, but it can also be sinister and destructive. Are we really willing to say it's OK to fabricate evidence and that exposing these fabrications is hateful? Really? Is that the lesson we want our children to learn? <laughs>